Hi, everybody. My name is Michael Littman. I'm really happy to be giving this talk to you guys today. And um, the title of my talk is The Four Ways We Tell Machines What We Want and How We Can Do Better. But really, the secret <laughs> title is uh, kind of an introduction to machine learning from the a human standpoint. So what does is, what is machine learning and computer science more generally mean for us as people who want to get machines to do things on our behalf, to do things for us? And what new capabilities does, does that actually provide for us? So I've been working in computer science one way or another for, turns out, 41 years, which seems like a very big number. And uh, I'm a professor at Brown University. I teach computer science. And my research is in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and a sub area called uh, reinforcement learning, which we'll talk a little bit about today. All right, so just to give you some, some context of where I'm coming from in all this, I think it's helpful if we think about creatures, if we think about living creatures uh, interacting with the world. So I, um, as I said, I'm a computer scientist, but I'm also a little bit of a psychology groupie. I like to hang around with cognitive psychologists and understand the sorts of problems that they study because I think it's really interesting that we're, you know, we're these intelligent beings in this physical world. Like, how does that come to be? And the way that cognitive scientists think about cognition is they, they think about a creature, in this case a, a cat, interacting with the world, which I have represented as a little planet there, taking in information from the world through its senses, and then acting on the world through things like, well, moving, uh, moving its paws around, transporting itself from one place to another, making meowing sounds, maybe just like making its tail bushy. There's lots of things that it can do to actually influence the physical world in, in one way or another. In between the sensing and the acting is, well, what psychologists would call cognition. It's the, the animal is thinking about what it should be doing. And so in this particular case, let's say that the, the cat is getting ready to pounce on a mouse, it's doing some kind of calculation-like thing. It's, it's thinking, all right, well, once the mouse, as long as the mouse is too far for me to pounce on it, I'm just going to hold steady. I'm just going to wait here. But <laughs> once the, the mouse gets close enough, I'm going to go for it. So we can make an analogy, a direct analogy, between this kind of creature loop, this cognitive loop, and what a computer scientist might call a computational loop. So a robot is in a very similar kind of scenario to, a, to an animal like a cat. Here we have a robot that's uh, trying to pick up a block. And as long as the block distance is larger, farther away than the, the gripper range, the robot moves forward, it rolls closer to the block. And so from this perspective, other than we would not call what the robot's doing cognition, we might call it computation, it's actually very, very parallel to what we see with animals. The big difference, the thing that makes this very, very different, and the reason that psychologists aren't computer scientists and computer scientists aren't psychologists, is because there's another piece to this story, and that is to say people. So when a robot is doing something, it's different than a cat. A cat is jumping on the mouse because it's hungry, right? It actually needs that to survive. The robot really only exists for our purposes. It's, it exists to do work on our behalf. And so this story isn't really complete until we think about a person having an actual goal, right? Whereas the cat kind of had a goal, now a person has a goal, but that goal is being transmitted or delegated to the machine. And that's the whole point of, of us having these machines in the first place. It's not to make critters that are out there in the world like foraging for their own food. They're doing stuff for us. And so it's really important to think about this communication channel between our ideas, what we want to actually accomplish, how do we convey that into the machine so that it can actually get done by the machine, save us some, some energy along the way. So I like to use this, an example uh, of, imagine that you want to, tell somebody how to water tomatoes. Now, why would you do that? Well, I don't know, tomatoes are kind of delicious and they're relatively good for you. They're, they're wholesome, uh, but they're kind of a pain to, <laughs> to, to, to take care of. And so it would be really great to have somebody do this for us, even better to have a machine do it for us. But uh, let's first think about what it would mean to just instruct another person on how to water tomatoes. So uh, this is a video I found online that's just a really brief introduction to watering tomatoes. I want you to think about, uh, as you're listening, think about the things that she's including in what she says and does. Hi, 
I'm Ashley, and today I'm going to show you how to water your tomato plant. The easiest way to determine if it needs watered is the finger test. Simply stick your index finger about an inch down into the soil. If you bring it out and it's dry, it needs water. All right, so, so here she is kind of telling us about how to take good care of our tomato plants. And if you, if you listen really closely to the kind of information that she provided and the form that she provided it in, it's not just one thing. It's actually a whole bunch of different kinds of ideas. And, and I want to be able to talk about those ideas uh, in the context of telling computers what to do. So in particular, I would classify the different things that, that she was saying in the video and the different ways that we actually get computers to do things on two different axes. So one axis is you can convey instructions. So you can say, you know, do this, stick your finger in the dirt, right? That was a, a very specific instruction that she gave in the video. And then there are things like uh, incentives, like you don't want, she didn't quite phrase it this way, but you don't want the, the soil to be too dry. Like one of the goals of watering is to make sure that the soil isn't too dry, that the, uh, the, the dirt will stick to your finger a little bit. So, um, so those are, that's one dimension is, are you trying to convey instructions? Or are you trying to in convey incentives, the goals that, that you're trying to, to get across? The other dimension is how are you conveying that information? Are you conveying it explicitly, like in words where you say, you know, do this, or are you conveying it by example? So in the, in the finger dirt example, uh, she said, stick your finger in the dirt. So she gave explicit instructions, but she also literally stuck her finger into the dirt and pulled it out and showed us what it looks like when you take your finger out of the dirt. So she gave us a concrete example as well. And the being explicit and giving examples are two complementary ways of trying to convey uh, instructions or incentives to people, but also to machines. Now, to think about this from the watering tomatoes scenario, we, should, we need to imagine that there's some kind of uh, computer program that we're going to write to actually water the tomatoes. And that computer program has various kinds of actions that it can take on the world. So let's imagine that it can spray water today, or it can not spray water today. It can just wait a day. And it can take in information about the environment. It can sense, uh, was there rainfall yesterday? Uh, did I spray the tomato yesterday? What's the temperature today? How tall is the, the tomato plant? These are all things that we can imagine if we connected a computer to the right sensors and stuck them in front of the tomato plant, we could get that information and we could write a computer program that would change that information into decisions about how to actually go about watering the tomatoes. So the, back in the day, not too long ago, there was really one way to tell machines what to do, and that was what I'm gonna call traditional programming, where you actually code rules that tell explicitly what, the, uh, what instructions the computer should carry out. And the key idea, what really makes this work, was make, what, what makes this so powerful, and it's not just um, like a remote control, right? You can, you can control machines by remote control, but that's kind of exhausting because you're really doing it yourself, you're just, you know, passing through some kind of intermediary, your direct instructions. What makes programming programming is the idea that you can also convey control flow and then put all of that onto the computer and have the computer then execute it autonomously. So here's a, here's a concrete example. If, you, if you've programmed before, you've recognized this kind of structure. If not, I, I think it's a, it's a relatively simple idea in this, in this case. So uh, we're gonna set up uh, a control flow where we're gonna give two instructions. One is to spray today, and the next one is to wait a day. But we're gonna put that inside a looping structure. So there's a forever around this, a kind of, you know, we're indented inside the forever. And so what we're saying is, follow these instructions. Spray today, wait a day, go back and do it all again. And do this over and over and over again without, without termination. So if you think about what this, this little program is saying, it's actually just, three lines, but it's, it's conveying an infinite sequence of instructions. It's, it's saying spray the tomatoes every other day. So that might be one way of actually watering the tomatoes. Turns out it's probably not a great one because if it rained, if it's been raining for the last week and then you spray again, you might actually end up overwatering the tomatoes. So we probably want a more sophisticated program if we want to do this well. But that's, that's fine. We can do that. With the idea of control flow, we can 
instruct the computer in a more sophisticated way to be more flexible and to take in information and make better decisions. So here's a slightly more complicated version. We're once again gonna repeat these instructions forever. And the first instruction is we're gonna ask a question. Has there not been rainfall or spray? So let me, let me break this down from inside out. So we're gonna ask, was, did it rain yesterday or did we spray water yesterday? If not, we're gonna spray today. Otherwise, that's the else, we're gonna wait a day. So what this idea is saying, what this program is saying, what we're conveying to the computer is spray every day where the previous day was dry. There was neither rain nor spraying that happened. Okay, and you can imagine making more and more sophisticated programs uh, that do more and more sophisticated rule following to actually carry out uh, more complicated tasks. So here's, um, here's another example that uses an, another really key idea in programming, which is uh, intermediate values or variables to uh, actually compute some information about the past and then depending on that information, including the temperature and how much rain there's been and over the last five days, it decides whether or not to spray or to wait. We don't have to go through that in detail, but the idea is that really we're only limited by our, our, our imagination. The more that we can think about expressing to the machine, the more that control flow and variables can be put together to carry out a really complicated strategy for watering the tomatoes. This idea, that the, I, I wrote it on the screen in a particular way, this idea of coding, but there's actually many different ways that coding uh, can be expressed. It's usually textual, and there's many, many programming languages that have been built by people to let other people tell computers what to do. There's uh, Algol, Basic, C++, Python, R, Scala. I, I, I tried to make one for every letter of the alphabet, but it didn't fit on the slide, so we'll just stick with these, these six for now. There's just been a ton of programming languages that people have invented and they have, they have very different flavors, uh, but they're all kind of variations on this idea of, of expressing control flow and expressing uh, using intermediate values to turn sensing into action. But I would also include visual interfaces. You don't have to just have kind of a textual representation. You can also have it be more graphical, like blocks that you click together. Even most uh, direct manipulation interfaces or GUI interfaces, uh, Forgetting what the G in GUI stands for, but basically interfaces where you, you drag and drop on the, on the computer screen. Also, essentially what you're conveying is what program, what instructions you want the system to follow. And there are some very simple, uh, very user-friendly schemes for doing programming, like trigger action programming. If you're familiar with the website IFT, uh, if this, then that, all the programs there have the form if some condition from a really now very large list of conditions uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of, of different possible conditions, then do some kind of behavior, some kind of action. And the actions depend on what services they've actually set up on their site and which things you actually have in your house. In my house, I've got a bunch of light bulbs that are actually connected to IFT. I've got my, uh, my washing machine and my dishwasher. And I tried to get my door lock connected, but um, Apparently that was a security issue. So, uh, so I, I can't actually control my door lock that way, but I can control lights and temperature and things like that with really simple little, little programs, little explicit instructions that say, if this, then that. So, so this is really great. Coding and programming gives, gives people a very expressive way of telling machines what to do. And for people who are, who are not very proficient at programming, there's simplifications like trigger action programming that, uh, that seem to work really well. But there is a shortcoming to all this. And I don't know if it's, it's obvious to you at this point, but if you've done any kind of programming or, or uh, used anything that, um, that was programmed, you'll notice that there's typically bugs. Bugs are seemingly unavoidable. It's really hard for people to say exactly what they want to the machine in a way that consistently ends up producing the right result. And there's some really classic examples. This is back from the, in the 1980s. There were some experiments that were done in a computer science department at an Ivy League university, you know, the students were not slackers, but beginning programming students in their first semester were, 86% of them were unable to express a program like, here, compute an average of a list of numbers, and that list is terminated by 99999. And people struggled. A uh, couple could do it, most of them got at least partway there, but very few of them could actually do the whole thing. And it's not just beginning programmers, right? Professional developers create bugs that have done all kinds of bad things. 
crashing the power grid, crashing the internet, crashing cars, spacecraft. It's, it's actually really, really hard. And they, they are very motivated to get it right, and it's still difficult. And even trigger action programs. We, we've done experiments in my group where we've uh, given people challenges in trigger action programming, and we discovered that, in fact, in, in some cases, uh, almost two thirds of people had a difficult time understanding what happens when, con when there's conjunctions in the rules that say, if uh, it's the temperature is high and the humidity is high, then such and such. Those kinds of and clauses can actually confuse beginning programmers uh, to the point where they end up giving wrong answers. They, they don't understand what their system's going to do. So is there some way that we could do better? Is there a way that we can go beyond programming to another way of conveying to computers what we want them to do? Computers are actually pretty powerful. And when we give them instructions, we're telling them step by step by step what to do. We're actually limiting their ability to carry out complicated tasks. We're telling them, do it this way. Um, and maybe there's a better way. And we just, we're not allowing them to that, that kind of flexibility, that freedom. So, so here's the idea. Instead of telling the computer what to do, what if we could tell them how they will be evaluated and they want to do well, right? So they have a motivation to do well. We get to decide what well means, then they act in the world. So what we're doing when we're programming or delegating in this kind of con concept is that we, the people, we, the programmer, create an explicit function that evaluates states of the world and says, the world is things are going well, things are going poorly. The program just has to produce that kind of evaluation. And then based on that evaluation, the computer gets to decide what actions to take to try to, to make you happy, to, to do what the objective function says is good. And so the key idea that makes this work is the notion of objectives, the notion that we're going to explicitly write down what's good and what's bad, and then leave it to the computer to fill in the details. So here's a concrete example or a couple of concrete examples. I didn't, uh, this is not what I thought I was going to talk about. Sorry. Uh, there are computer programs that actually have played board games extremely well using this idea that we convey to the computer what the objective is, maximizing points, winning the game. It then thinks about, well, what action should I take that will lead to that outcome? And so when people are programming chess or Go or even tic-tac-toe, they're not generally telling the computer what actions to do in what situations directly, they're telling them what winning looks like. And then the computer figures out what actions to take to bring about a win. As a result, these programs can actually outplay their programmers, right? So the, if the programmer uh, isn't necessarily very good at chess, but the program figures out how to make a win happen in chess, the programmer doesn't ha have to know how that happened. And so can be actually surprised about what the way that it works out. All right, so to make this work, I wonder if I'm showing the wrong talk. Is that possible? This is not what I thought was coming up next. All right, so, so sorry. So uh, reinforcement learning, this, this idea in computer science is known as reinforcement learning. So the idea here is that we're gonna provide the computer with information about what it can sense in the world and what actions it can take in the world. And it's going to make choices. It's gonna choose the actions subject to uh, the information that it's taking in through its senses with the goal of maximizing the objective function that we give it, the actual scoring function that tells it what it means to win, what it means to do well. Now, the machine, the computer, might have to experiment on its own to figure out which of those actions bring about good outcomes, right? So these programs that are playing chess, uh, they are typically programmed with the rules of chess right from the beginning. But if you're thinking about something like the tomato growing example, we don't really know the, the rules of tomato growing. We do know what information the computer can bring in and we want the tomato to be tall, but, um, but we don't know exactly how water and temperature and everything kind of mix together to create tomato growth. But a computer could experiment and learn some of that information on its own. So a program in the reinforcement learning setting might look something like this. We might tell it, okay, here's what I want you to do. Forever, use information about the rainfall, temperature, spray, height. Use that information to choose about spraying today or waiting a day with the goal of maximizing the height. So we have to tell it the goal. We have to, and it has to be something that the machine can measure. 
but it can go about actually figuring out how to make that happen. So I, I mentioned uh, this has been really useful in games. I wanted to mention that a little sooner. I think the slides are just out of order. They're the right slides. I just think I messed up the order. The way that people program programs, program machines, computers to play world-class chess, because the best chess playing programs are now better than the best chess playing humans who've ever existed, is by, well, this is a simplification, but basically explaining to the machine how to score the chess board to say, okay, well, you having a pawn is worth 100, you having a, a knight is, or sorry, a, a rook is worth 500, you having, the, you know, the king is worth 20,000, the, the queen's really important, but not as important as the king. So, so you kind of make a, a price list and you then tell the computer, okay, play out as many moves into the future as you have time. And when, when you, once you get to a board, you want to know how good that board is, score it according, according to these rules, and then take actions that lead to boards with high score. And this works amazingly well in chess. Uh, we, again, we have programs today that beat the best humans who've ever lived, who've ever played the game. And there's reason to believe that it's almost maxing out. It's almost playing perfect chess now. The, the, the best computer chess playing programs are approaching the best possible chess play. That's not true in all games, but it's, it's getting to be true in chess. But for the tomato watering space, again, we need this notion of learning. We need to actually uh, use our experience about the world to decide what to do. So let me give a concrete example of this. Uh, I, th I, think this <laughs> I think this is going to work. I haven't tried this yet. Uh, this is a video game, a little boat racing video game. And we want to control or we want to write a program that will cause the computer to be able to play this game well. Now, the computer's boat is that gray boat with the arrow pointing to it. And what we get to decide in the reinforcement learning setting is, what should it be trying to do? Well, we want it to win, but we have to make that very concrete. So it turns out this particular game, here, I'll, I'll show you this particular game. The, uh, the computer gets to control you know, the angle that the boat is facing and how much thrust it's using at any given moment in time. It can take in information about what's on the screen, what's around it. It gets points for bumping into some of the some of the good obstacles, and it loses time by bumping into bad obstacles. And ultimately, it's trying to get to the finish line before the other boats. Okay, so it's gone around the lap once. It's in fifth place. This boat is not doing particularly well. But the idea is that if we give it a good objective function and let it play a lot, so it can learn how to maximize that objective function, we might have a great player for this particular game. Now, it turns out not, the reinforcement learning is not really being used that often in, in the field. Uh, there's not a lot of things in your house that are using reinforcement learning, for example. That's, yeah, so, so that's not true of programming. There's probably a lot of things that are programmed in, that you interact with on a daily basis. You're, you're listening <laughs> to me talk through a computer. That computer is programmed with kind of traditional programs. Not a lot of reinforcement learning, but there is some a couple cases where, where it has been used. The, the Nest thermostat, which uh, some people have in their houses to control the temperature, uh, the, it, it's running a learning program to figure out how much energy it takes to heat your house to a certain degree. And it actually tries to optimize a combination of making the temperature be the temperature that you ask it to be and not using too much energy on, on the way to do that. And the reason this is a great example of reinforcement learning is once it's got that, that function, in the factory, the people who program these, these thermostats don't have to know how your house works, whether it's in a particularly cold place or it tends to retain heat really well. The thermostat can actually learn that on its own within your house. It's a really powerful idea. Another one that I'm not going to get into details on, I think, is, uh, is YouTube recommendation, which is the idea that the, the decision about what videos to suggest to you. So if you're watching YouTube, I imagine probably all of you have, have watched YouTube for one reason or another, that the, when you're finished watching a video, there's usually like a list of videos that you could then watch next. And the, the programmers at, well, now uh, Alphabet, Google, wanted to try to uh, you know, make, this, make those recommendations as useful as possible or make, help them make as much money as possible or something. 
And so the way they, they, they did this is they don't have a rule that says, if person watches video X, show them, you know, recommend video Y, there's a learning system, there's a reinforcement learner behind the scenes that's trying to figure out, well, for, for what, what should I show the person who just watched this video next? And the way they, they do this, as far as I understand, is using a form of reinforcement learning. They had to pick an objective function, and the objective function is they wanna show you videos that you're gonna watch. So, uh, so one thing that could be to try to maximize the, the likelihood that someone will click on one of the presented links. All right, that's something that it can be, that the system can measure, and it's something that it can experiment with. It can show, it can show a video to somebody and then experiment with the different kinds of possible next videos to show and then observe whether or not it was effective, whether or not the person actually clicked on the link. The thing that I, well, so I think, first of all, I think that's really cool. It's, it's pretty amazing. It works, it works remarkably well. The, the recommendations that YouTube gives are pretty compelling. The thing that I want you to just think about, at least briefly, is the fact that there's many different objectives that they could have chosen. When they choose clicking, what tends to happen is people putting videos online try to make those videos seem very enticing so people will click on them. And then people click on them, and that sends a signal to the YouTube recommendation system saying, hey, that was great. We got somebody to click on something. What happens is YouTube learns how to provide clickbaity content, right? It, it, it learns to put up videos that you're very likely to click on, even if once you click on it, you're like, oh, why did I do that? I didn't want to do that. That was the wrong thing to do. So they change their objective function at some point from clicking to watching time. Okay, well, watching time is better because once you've clicked on the video, if you then realize that it's terrible, you will extricate yourself. You will you know, stop that video, and that will be a signal to YouTube that, well, that wasn't a good recommendation. It wasn't the sort of thing that people will watch. Of course, what the video providers discovered and what I guess in some sense YouTube itself realized is that some videos, especially videos that make people really angry, are really great to get them to watch more, right? Especially if they just watched one angry video, <laughs> watching another angry video, they're gonna watch it all the way through. And so what, what seems to have happened is it's, they've, they've created a kind of outrage generator that, uh, that is constantly trying to show you videos that are gonna get you upset. Because if you're upset, you're going to watch more videos and that's the objective that it tried to, uh, to, to optimize. That was what they chose. That's what the programmers at, at Google and YouTube chose. So this is a really tough problem. And you know, first of all, you as a YouTube watcher should be wary of this. You should be really aware if, you're, if, you, if you think that you've spent, if you're, if you're waiting for a video to load, you should ask yourself, wait a second, is this really what I want to be doing right now? Or should I move on to something else? Because in some cases, they've gotten really good at just sucking you in. You need to be careful about that. And the other thing is we all need to be kind of aware of the fact that, um, you know, that this kind of manipulation can happen. And there's alternatives. There's other objective functions that you can give the system that would cause other kinds of behaviors to happen. Returning back to the Coast Runner example, this boat racing example, uh, the, the reinforcement learning researchers who were experimenting with said, oh, I know, well, there's points in the game. Why don't we just tell the computer to maximize points? And so this, this is a video of the resulting learned behavior. This is our, our gray boat that's supposed to be winning the race. What is it actually doing? First of all, it's spinning around like crazy. It's smashing into all sorts of things. And then now it's catching on fire, running into tankers. Just now it's going in a circle and it's just gonna keep going in a circle. Why? What the heck is happening here? Well, it turns out if you watch really closely, right now there are green things that are appearing on the screen that are worth points that the boat is bumping into, earning those points, and then looping around and getting them again when they regenerate. This boat is so much better at getting points than anything else you could imagine. Once again, it's optimizing the wrong thing. We told it to optimize points, it's optimizing points. We watch what happens and we realize that's not actually what we wanted it to do. It's, it's doing not what we wanted, even though it's doing exactly what we told it to do. So maybe we need to get away <laughs> from this idea of giving instructions. Maybe instructions are actually causing uh, more problems than we really wanted. Because both in the case of programming and in the case of reinforcement learning, we gave instructions the machine follows them very literally, and the literal follow of the instructions results in sometimes unwanted behavior.
So maybe, maybe it shouldn't do, maybe, you know, don't do what I say, do what I do. Like, sh let me show you. So we're going to get into an, another model now where we're going to give examples of instructions or, or, or of the results of instructions, uh, an area that's known as supervised learning. And you, usually you'll hear it called just machine learning uh, in, in the press, sometimes deep learning because that sounds cooler. And that's about basically using examples to find instructions. We're going to, to make this work, we're going to use two important ideas from the reinforcement learning case that we just talked about previously. That one is the, the idea of an objective function. We're going to use that. And the other one is learning from experience. But what we're going to do differently this time is we're going to make the, object, the objective function, uh, we're going to make the learning, I'm sorry, part of the process of actually programming the system. We're going to use data. We're going to collect data and we're going to present to the machine data. And it's going to use that data to actually figure out what to do on our behalf. And the basic idea of this is just mimicking an expert. So if we return back to the tomato watering example, what we're really trying to do here is we're going to provide to the computer lots of data on different situations and what an expert thinks the right thing to do in that situation is. We're going to arrange it as basically a giant table. So our table is going to have entries like, OK, here's the situation. We've got uh, a day where it rained, the, it, it rained previously. We didn't spray yesterday. The temperature today is high. The tomato plant is pretty short. And we asked an expert gardener what to do. And the gardener said, wait, don't, don't spray today. Just let it go. Then another day happens, or maybe another tomato plant on the same day. And in that case, there wasn't rainfall and there wasn't spray. The temperature was low. The tomato was short. And the gardener said to spray. And we just try to get as many examples like this as we can to kind of build a very detailed picture of what do experts do in lots of different situations. Okay, so that's going to be our input to the computer. That's going to be how we tell the computer how to behave. We're going to record essentially the expert behaving and then present as a, as a report to the computer. Here's what the expert does. Okay, now what happens? Now what we do is we've, def we've, behind the scenes, we've devised an objective function on behaviors or on rules. And the objective function says, pick a rule that maximizes how well the rule matches the expert's decision in the same situations. So the system is trying to mimic the expert. It's gonna look through the space of possible rules to find rules that mesh really well with the examples that it was given, okay? It doesn't know what it's trying to do. All it's trying to do is act like the expert as best it can. Now, if we give it lots and lots and lots of examples and the rule system that it's kind of searching through isn't overly complicated where it can just memorize all those, those examples, it will tend to learn a rule that generalizes well, that actually behaves like the expert, even in cases that were not in the data. Okay, it's still, it, it, the hope is that it will make good decisions even in cases that it's never seen before during training. And this turns out to work incredibly well. There's, there are a bunch of computer systems today that are created uh, by this, this machine learning perspective. Uh, one is spam filtering, the, the idea that when, you're, when email comes into your, to your inbox, it's scanned to determine whether or not it might be unsolicited email, right? Email that's some kind of a scam. And those emails are kind of shunted off to the side and the system presents you with the ones that it thinks are legitimate emails. That's a machine learning problem. The, the systems that, do, that, 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 have, that are created to do this have actually been trained on lots of examples of email messages and then expert labels as to whether they are spam or legitimate email. And that saves people tons of time. Uh, there, was, there was a fear back, back in the early days of email that spam would so overtake uh, the, the whole email system, that it would cease to be a useful way to communicate because 90% of what was coming in was garbage and you'd have to sift through it. Now we have machine learning systems that actually do that sifting for us. They're not perfect. You've probably noticed cases where spam gets through and you might have uh, noticed some unfortunate cases where someone sends you an important email and the, the spam filter says, oh, that's spam and, and, and hides it from you. So that's not ideal. But most of the time, most of the email messages, it actually does a fantastic job. 
uh, image recognition is another problem that we didn't have a good solution to without machine learning. So here's examples of a bunch of photographs that a machine was able to identify uh, what was going on in the photograph, having been trained on tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of example photographs. This particular system knows, I think, about a thousand different categories. And so every image that it gets has to be classified as one of those thousand. A thousand is a lot, but we know way more categories than that, we as, as, as people in the world. So, um, you know, we might classify that the picture of the person playing the flute as a flautist, like the picture seems to be of the person playing the flute, but that's not a category that the system had and it makes its best guess and best guess is flute, which is pretty good best guess. It's pretty amazing. Uh, thinking about how we would directly program a computer to make these kinds of determinations to say, you know, that's a sea lion and not a seal. I, I have a different difficult time telling sea lions and seals apart, but I think the I think the computer can do it. Um, it's, it's pretty remarkable. And this is all happening by this, this notion of supervised machine learning. Speech recognition, the fact that we can talk to computers and they can kind of understand us. They don't really understand what we're trying to say or do, but they understand the individual words and sometimes that can trigger behaviors that we, that we want. Um, that was enabled entirely by, by machine learning. This was a, a problem that even 10 years ago was not solved and now it's pretty much solved. You can talk to your phone, you can talk to uh, like an in-house speaker system. Some people have TVs that you can, you can talk to. It's, it's pretty amazing. This, this wasn't something that we knew how to do not too long ago. Translating between languages is another example that, was, that uh, machine learning has made a huge leap in progress uh, as a way of programming computers to translate information from one language to another. Uh, and there's been some, you know, fun examples like if you show, speaking of YouTube, if you show a computer vision system lots and lots and lots of pictures of YouTube and ask it just to try to, you know, remember all it can, it ends up learning an internal representation of a lot of things. But one of the things that it learns an internal representation of is this, which if you look at it, you can see it's a cat. Uh, Nobody programmed it to recognize cats. It was just told, okay, this is the kind of data that we want you to understand. Try to do your best to make sense of it. That's how it made sense out of what's on YouTube. There are a lot of cat videos on YouTube. So the upside of machine learning is that it's actually provided us a way to solve some very difficult problems that we had no idea how to solve even very recently. The last, I would say five years has seen an explosion of progress in computer science driven primarily by, by uh, machine learning. But there are issues. This is not a foolproof technology. This is not the thing that we should all be using to tell our computers what to do all the time. One of, them, one of the problems with it is it's actually hard to get all the data that you need to make these systems happen. The, the image recognition system that I alluded to in the previous slide is trained with hundreds of thousands of photographs, millions of photographs. And so most people for most problems that they have to solve don't have that kind of data laying ar around to train a, a new classifier, a new computer system, new rule to do what they want. But that's not the only problem. And uh, with, especially with the data that you need because the way we're telling the machines what to do is with the data. So the data is actually really important. So here's, a, here's, I think, a really neat example. Uh, we, you can train a machine learning system to distinguish husky and wolf from example. So if you know uh, what a wolf is, it's sort of like a, I don't know, scary dog. Um, husky is an actual dog, but it looks a lot like a wolf. And so if we wanted to, to tell them apart, no, you know, this one's a wolf, this one's a wolf, this one's a husky, uh, we, can, we can do that by giving a big training set of lots of images along with their, their labels the the categories that, that they belong to and if you do this with pictures like naturally occurring pictures of huskies and wolves you learn something pretty surprising which is if you give the system a picture of a husky dog in snow like outside playing in the snow the system's like that's a wolf and you're like no that's a husky it's like pretty sure it's a wolf okay what makes you think it's a wolf i don't know it's, it has that wolf thing all right, well, if you drill down and try to understand exactly what it's looking at, it's looking at the background because most of the wolf pictures that you, that you would find, the wolves are in the forest and often in the snow. And so if you see snow, it's probably a wolf. And, and recognizing snow 
is a lot easier for the system than recognizing the detailed differences in the ears and the snout that can tell you the difference between a dog and a wolf. So uh, that's a problem, right? The system isn't generalizing properly. And because we didn't really program it in a traditional way, it's very hard to make it not do that. We end up having to, uh, what they end up learning are these associations that we maybe intended and maybe didn't intend. And if we don't want it to learn those things, we actually have to give it data where those associations are, are broken, right? Where they're not there. So we'd have to give it lots of pictures of huskies in snow, probably explicitly to make sure that it overrides its bias to see snow as an indicator of wolf. And that means that we're actually doing a tremendous amount of, of effort, putting in a lot of effort into the data that we actually feed the system with. All right, so I wanna mention one last box of my little two by two different ways that we tell machines what to do. And that's the combination of examples like we were just doing with machine learning and incentives, the idea of trying to learn, or the idea of, of representing target behavior using an objective function. So now what we're gonna to try to do is learn the objective function from examples. And the, the main idea that makes this work, I call counterfactuals, the idea that what the system is going to try to do to understand your incentives from the examples that you give it is to ask, what would you have done if your target incentives, if the thing that you were trying to make happen were this? Would you have done what you just showed me, right? That's actually a really sophisticated kind of reasoning, again, called counterfactual reasoning. It's, it's asking, what would be, what would it be? How would this go? And that's a really powerful idea of kind of getting at what could be happening behind the scenes. So I wanna give you kind of a taste of this. So here's an example uh, from, from one of my papers where, where we've got a robot that's in kind of a little video game setting. It's, it's uh, or you can think of it kind of like a chessboard or something like that, where the, the robot can move from square to square to square, uh, adjacent squares on the, on the grid. When it goes through a square of a certain color, that could be either good or bad, we don't know. Um, and then, uh, you know, so basically you can move around in the grid and you get points or not. Uh, now I'm not gonna tell you what the points are, but I will show you how I would behave in this environment. So here's a trajectory that I made the robot take. Now, in this setting of trying to infer incentives from an example, what you should be thinking is, huh, why did he send the robot that way? What is he like and not like in the world for that to be the case? And in particular, what point values or dollar figure can we assign to each, color, each category of colored square so that this behavior makes sense, right? That this is the kind of behavior that would be generated. So this is kind of like the reinforcement learning problem, right? In the reinforcement learning problem, we give, we assign values to each of the colored squares, and then we say, now you can behave however you want, but what you're trying to do is maximize your points, maximize your dollars. Now we're going in the opposite direction. We're saying, here's behavior. Now I want you to figure out what the dollar values must have been for that behavior to have been reasonable behavior. That's the counterfactual reasoning. So I'll let you, I'll let you think about this for a couple seconds. So I want you to think about how much is the, are the white squares worth? How much are the blue squares worth? Are they more or less valuable than the white squares? How about the orange squares? How about the green square? Okay, all right. Well, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through one by one and, and do the reasoning that I make when I look at this example. So we'll start off, it kind of, makes sense to just call white neutral in this particular case. Uh, it's kind of the background color of the grid. And we'll call, it, we'll call it worth zero. And now everything else is either gonna be positive and attractant to the robot or negative, kind of something repellent. So uh, let's start with green. Is green a good thing or a bad thing? Well, if you look at the path that the robot takes, it looks pretty much like it's going to green. Right? If it hated green, it could just stay where it is. <laughs> so it's got to like green more than white. So we'll assign it, I don't know, 46 cents. All right, what about blue? So it didn't go to blue, and it, it never went to blue. And in fact, it looks like maybe it was dodging blue. 
So this particular path, it might be indifferent to blue. It doesn't seem particularly attracted to blue. It certainly seems to like green more than that. But it seems to like blue less than white, right? Because the white, it's, it's, it's staying on the white and kind of avoiding the blue. So that's like negative a quarter. All right, what about orange? Now, orange is trickier because if you like green enough, you have to go through orange in this, in this example. Right? There's nothing it can do to avoid the orange. It can't like exit the grid or hop over the orange. So it has to go through orange. It can't love orange, right? If it loved orange, it would have just stayed there. And it can't dislike orange just to, let's see, it can't dislike orange a lot. Because if it disliked orange a lot, it can just not go to green at all. Because it's like, you know what? Not worth it. All right, you can imagine situations like that where like, hey, you know, ice cream cone, come get the ice cream cone. All you have to do is walk through that broken glass. You're like, you know what? Not interested in ice cream right now. So the orange might be negative, but it can't be too negative. So the, this, the, this particular inverse reinforcement learning system that I built ends up assigning it, you know, negative six cents. So it's, it's definitely negative. It's, it's not attracted to orange. It could have walked all over that whole orange stripe, but it didn't, do, it, didn't, it didn't do that. So it's negative, but not too negative. All right, what about yellow? So is, is yellow more or less negative compared to orange? Well, in the yellow case, it could have avoided it entirely. So it can't be very negative because if it were very negative, it just would have been skipped. It's not particularly positive because the, the, the robot isn't spending a lot of time there. It's just kind of hitting it and moving on. So it's probably somewhere in between. So our inverse reinforcement learning system ended up assigning it you know, negative a penny. But these, these values, you know, extracted from this one example, are actually a really good description of the agents or the, the, the robot's kind of decisions that it made. And now that we have them, we could scramble the grid around. We can move where the colors are. We can put the, the robot in an entirely new grid situation with these same colors, and it can decide how to act without any kind of additional instruction. It can just learn from those values that it was given. That's a really neat and powerful idea. Now, this isn't really being used very often. I, I, I'm led to understand that uh, some self-driving cars have actually been, have used kind of a version of this where uh, it's difficult to know how important is it that the car go fast versus how important is it that the car doesn't bump too much. And the faster you go, if you're on a bumpy road, the more bumps are gonna happen. If you make it so that the, uh, the cost of the bumps is really high, it will avoid the bumpiness, but it will actually go super slow, like probably too slow. So instead of trying to just make up these numbers, they actually have really good drivers drive the car on different kinds of surfaces. And then they ask, what, <laughs> what scoring function are those drivers using that causes them to go this speed on this road and this other speed on this road? And it can actually extract information from that. I say this isn't really fielded because I don't think any, um, any actual self-driving cars that are for sale do this, but yeah, but researchers are actually playing with it in, in the real world. But there is a really compelling example of this basic idea that I do wanna tell you about that is being used in the world. And that's the notion of generative adversarial networks or GANs. So what a GAN is, is a set of, of machine learning networks that actually produce images. So to make a computer, to make to the system generate an image, it needs some kind of objective function, right? It needs a way of saying, okay, here's the, here's the drawing I made essentially of a face. How good a face is this? You can ask a person, but that's gonna, it needs a lot more practice than that. This is, the computer needs a way of evaluating its images on its own. Well, you could use the kind of image recognition systems that I was talking about in the previous section. So those are systems that you give it an image and it says, oh, that's a matchstick. Oh, that's a daisy. Oh, that's a bottle opener. Oh, that's a face. Hey, good, you've got a face, right? So because we have these kinds of programs already, we can ask a computer to generate images to try to make that face recognizer say, yes, you've got a face. Turns out that doesn't work. Partly because the way that these systems are actually recognizing faces are a little bit alien to us. So it ends up generating images that don't look at all like a face, but the system's like, that's totally a face. I recognize that as a face. Yep, that's a face. I'm like, no, no computer, no. So it's not clear what objective function we should be giving it to make this work. 
So the idea that people came up with, the idea of a generative adversarial network, is that we're going to have two networks that are actually trying to learn to fool each other, in a sense. So one network is trying to generate realistic looking faces. The other network is trying to train, it's being trained to distinguish real pictures, like photographs of people's faces from these generated images that the other network produced. Okay, so it's given pairs of images and it's asked to say which one is real and which one's not. We, we know how to train that, that's just a standard machine learning problem. And we know how to train the generator because it has now an objective function. Its objective function is fool the other network. And they engage in this kind of simultaneous mutual learning of trying to trick each other. And that works really well. So this image that I'm, that I'm showing you right now, I feel like I could tell you this is the researcher who invented GANs um, because it looks like a photograph of a real person, but it's actually not. This comes from a website called thispersondoesnotexist.com because this person does not exist. And every time you visit that website, and I encourage you to try it, it, will, it generates an entirely new face that has never been drawn before that belongs to no human being. Um, it's really quite remarkable. If you look at it and it's like, yeah, well, that's clearly a photograph of a person. You know, like, how does it know to make the, the picture so realistic? Like, you know, the teeth look right, you know? Like, they're the right color. They're not too white. They're not too not white. They're about the right sizes and, and uh, orientations to each other. There's a little bit of shine on them from the, camera, from the light source that isn't actually there. It's amazing. Now, if you stare at these enough, you can start to pick up on the weirdnesses, that there's things that are just not right in these images, like the background. Take a really good look at the background. It doesn't make any sense. It looks like a background, but it doesn't look like anything in the world, right? It's all sort of distorted and it doesn't, doesn't really, things don't line up correctly. And you'll see that if you generate a lot of these faces, almost all the, the backgrounds look a little bit funky. And if it's not the background, like the clothes sometimes don't make sense. There's like collars that have no buttons sometimes. Uh, sometimes there's sort of weird things around the ears. So they're not perfect, but they are kind of eerily good at what they do. And a lot of people are afraid that these kinds of things, they call them deep fakes, um, could actually be used to generate fake news stories or fake, um, fake videos of real people doing things that they never actually did and getting them into a lot of trouble. So this is, this is a bit of a big deal right now. And that's, and that's the four things. That's what I wanted to tell you about. And we, we're just about out of time. So let me just, as a, as a quick recap, here are the four ideas again, traditional programming where you're giving explicit instructions, reinforcement learning where you're given ex giving explicit incentives, supervised learning where you're giving examples of instructions, and loss function learning, the, the sort of GAN style thing where you're giving examples and it's inferring incentives from that. And each of these has, has strengths and weaknesses. And one of the things I think is really interesting is I think they're the same things. I think that the, uh, the strength of programming, traditional programming, is that the system does what it's told, right? So it does what it's told. You tell it to do the. The problem with it is it does what it's told, right? Sometimes the thing that you told it to do isn't what you actually wanted. In reinforcement learning, it can generate surprising results, things that you didn't even think to try. But the bad thing is it can generate surprising results, things that you didn't want at all. Uh, in in uh, supervised learning, it can mimic anything, right? Anything, any function that you give it, it can find a way to copy it. The bad thing is that it copies everything about your function, even stuff that you didn't necessarily want. And in this, this notion of loss function learning, it processes things very, very deeply. But a problem with that is that it processes things very deeply. It's very expensive to actually get computers to do this. This may not scale to, to be something that's useful for all of us. Uh, it's just at the moment, it's an idea that's, that's really expensive. So, what I want to end on is the, the observation that when we tell people what to do, like in the tomato growing example in the very beginning of the talk, we don't just build systems around, or we don't just talk to people in one of these boxes at a time. We actually mesh together mechanisms from each of these different boxes because we really want to make sure that people get it. We tell them the instructions, we give them an example that they, so they can infer the instructions. We tell them the incentives, we give them an example so they can infer the incentives. We give them every opportunity to get it right. And we need to be building our computer systems that way too. In many cases, it's very important that the computer gets it right. 
And so we need to be thinking more about, and we now in this case is, is computer scientists, so some of you and, and people like me, who, um, who really need to be making sure that we can build systems that get it right. And so, so really to empower all of us to use computing to make the world a better place, make, make the world the kind of place that we want. And that's my talk. So thanks for listening. <laughs>